All right, guys, we're gonna get started here. I wanna welcome everyone today for small game hunting. Uh, we threw some upland in here as well. So small game and upland hunting. Uh, so this is really a entry level kind of uh, webinar that we're gonna do, but also the hunting that this is. This is really some of the first types of hunting that people might do um, either as a kid or as an adult getting into hunting. So we're going to kind of break down what it takes to get into the sport and uh, then the different strategies and stuff to go over uh, how to hunt these different species of animals. Um, so some quick reminders. So your microphones and, and webcams are disabled, but if you have a question, uh, you can throw that into the Q&A uh, pop up there or in the chat and we'll answer those either live or we'll type you an answer. And we also um, will email you a copy of the PowerPoint that we're using today as well as any infographics that we may have on small game hunting. And we'll give you a link to a recording of this. So if you wanna come back and look at it and uh, you remember that we said something that you might wanna go check back on later, you can go and find that at the link and the recording of this webinar. And then um, also we'll send you a feedback survey. So please fill that out. If uh, you can please get that back to us, that helps us understand what we can do better and uh, kind of uh, who our audience is. So that really helps us gear our program a little bit better as we develop. And um, again, at the end of uh, the webinar, we'll have time for a Q&A and we'll sit here and answer any questions you may have about hunting in Illinois, really. If you wanna keep it to small game and upland, that's fine. But if you have any other questions, we'll be here to answer them for you. So uh, presenters today, we have Dan Stevens. Dan, would you like to say hi? Sure, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us. And then we also have Curtis Twelman. Curtis, you wanna say hi real quick? Hello everybody. Hi Curtis. And then uh, I am Jason Buckley. So again, um, we're gonna be talking about uh, hunting regulations for these different species. Then we're gonna go over rabbit ecology and hunting strategies as well as squirrel and then upland. Uh, so again, this is really the entry level stuff. And as we go over the gear and things, you're gonna see why really you can get away with uh, just a shotgun and a good pair of hiking boots to get into this. But uh, to make sure you're doing it correctly, we're gonna have Dan start us off with regs. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So we're going to touch base on just a, a few of the, the kind of basic regulations that you need to keep in mind when we talk about, you know, a few of these species. And and like Jason mentioned, you know, the, the, the value of small game hunting is uh, a few different things. One, the regulations are, are fairly simplified compared to, you know, some other types of hunting, whether it's waterfowl, deer, um, even turkey to some extent, but also opportunity is, is kind of readily available. And as we move through these season dates, you'll you'll see these seasons are, are quite lengthy and access and opportunity is um, somewhat abundant. Uh, I, I put air quotes around that because, again, we, we do live in Illinois. We don't have a, a ton of public land and hunting opportunity, but um, it certainly is there. And one of the, the, the fun and enjoyable aspects of, of small game hunting is it can be as in-depth and aggressive as you want. So when we go through, you know, some of these very specific strategies later on, we'll, we'll start off with, you know, a few of the simplistic strategies that you can use, uh, but we'll kind of move into a little bit more advanced uh, topics just for, for those instances where you may not be seeing the animals or they may not be as abundant on the landscape in your area. So we try to take this kind of proactive approach through this webinar of going over the regulations, diving into the animal behavior and ecology so we can understand what we expect these animals to, to be doing, where we expect them to be, and where we expect them to be to be going. And so that's that's kind of how we, we kind of designed today's PowerPoint. So we'll quickly go over uh, some basic regulations. This will be kind of your your bread and butter uh, for, for Illinois hunting. This is the, the digest of hunting and trapping regulations. It has all of the, the information right here. I do want to go ahead and caution that this is not the the quote unquote legally binding agreement or you know legislative documents that have the exact verbiage. This is essentially somebody's interpretation of the the wildlife code. And so as you're reading through this, just keep that in mind that you may you know be reading through and go, oh, there may be a loophole there. Well, not in fact there again there may be, but chances are it's just written a little bit differently from the wildlife code. So just kind of keep that in mind. Again, this is somebody's interpretation and is designed to make the the legalese a little bit easier for for us to to understand. But we'll kind of go through legal game, and so that's going to be what species you can actually harvest um, during these 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 different you know hunting seasons. And so that's kind of where we'll start. We'll transition to what credentials do you need. Um, talk a little bit about lottery applications for the, some of these species that allow you, you know, some additional opportunity or access. And then we'll discuss uh, again a little bit about hunting season dates and then post-harvest procedures if there are any. 
And again, if you have any questions as we kind of move through this, drop them in the chat or the, the Q&A feature, and we'll, we'll get to those as, as quick as we can. So again, I kind of just referenced this book. This is, again, the, the Digest of Hunting and Trapping Regulations. Um, as an Illinois hunter, this is kind of your bread and butter. It tells you exactly what you can do, when you can do it, where you can do it, and most importantly, how you can do it. Um, I also recommend downloading the, the PDF on your phone. It's available on DNR's website. You can see this link here. Um, and we'll also put that in the chat, if, if Jason, if you want to type that out in the chat really quick. Uh, but the nice thing about having it on your phone, um, especially if you're a little bit more tech intuitive, not necessarily tech savvy, uh, but a lot of these smartphones now have the ability to search through an entire PDF document. So similar to, you know, your control F on a, on a laptop or a, a, a PC, you can kind of do that same thing. So you can quickly navigate through that document. And it's always nice to have while you're out hunting in case, oh, I need to check something real quick. You can just pop it up and, and pull it up right there. So I do recommend I have several of these kind of stashed in my vehicle around the house, uh, but also have one on a, a mobile device just in case, again, you need to quickly reference something. It's, it's right there for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about legal games. So again, these are what species of, of animals we're going to be hunting during these small game seasons. Uh, so first, we're going to start off with rabbit season. Um, the, the, the legal game here is going to be the eastern cottontail rabbit. Uh, pretty, pretty standard. This is what you see kind of bopping around your neighborhoods um, and in your yards and more suburban areas. But outside of that, in some of these more rural and, and kind of wildland areas, these are almost a completely different, different species. Even though they're the same species, they act and behave very differently. And so we'll talk about a few of those differences as we kind of move through the ecology section. But it is important to note that we do not need to be able to distinguish gender um, among rabbits. We don't need to know whether it's male or female, that does not matter. Um, you won't be able to tell anyway until you get that, that, that animal in hand. So this is kind of your standard legal game for the, the rabbit season. This is the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. Now for squirrel, it gets a little bit more, I, I don't want to say complex, but there are several different species of squirrel that can be harvested during the squirrel season. We have the gray squirrel, which is kind of that, that one that you most commonly see in your neighborhoods, hitting your you know bird feeders, tearing apart your garden. And then we have this fox squirrel, which fox squirrels are a little bit bigger on average. Um, they often have this kind of reddish tint to them. Now I don't want to get that confused with a red squirrel, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but this fox squirrel on average is going to be quite a bit bigger than your standard gray squirrel. They also really prefer areas that are kind of dominated by agriculture. And so you may find them commonly in areas where you have kind of an intersection of, of edge habitat. So you have this edge habitat where you have crop field basically going into a forest. Um, fox squirrels can be very prominent in those, those areas. Um, I will say I don't particularly hunt them a little bit differently. Um, but as, as kind of Curtis discusses through some of the hunting strategies that, that he'll get into for squirrel hunting, there is quite a bit of taste difference when you, when you look at these two, two squirrels. Um, a lot of people will prefer the gray squirrel. They have a, a little bit of a, of a more tender uh, meat. Now, obviously, you do get a little bit more from the, the fox squirrel just because, again, it's on average a little bit bigger of an animal. Uh, but there is certainly a, a flavor difference. And, and Curtis will talk to you about that. He's a, a squirrel hunt machine. But these are your, your, two, uh, your two legal game. There are a couple of other species of squirrels that are protected in Illinois, um, one being the, the red squirrel. So this is a very, very small squirrel. So you, you should not get this confused with a fox squirrel. It's almost chipmunk size, very, very small, um, typically have a, a lot of red coloration. Um, and we also have the flying squirrel in Illinois. Now, these are completely nocturnal. Um, so you're, you're typically not going to see them throughout the day too often, but a few months back, Jason, I, and Curtis were actually at an event, I think setting up 3D archery targets for a 3D archery shoot, and we actually ran across a flying squirrel in really the, the middle of the morning at about 10 o'clock. So occasionally they'll be out, but 99% of the time you'll, you'll never see them during daylight hours. They're completely nocturnal, um, so you don't really have to worry about seeing those too often. Yeah, and one thing I'll point out, just look at the eyes on the flying squirrel. Look how yeah. dark they are. That that really uh, stood out to us when we saw that. Plus, it's about a half the size. So uh, put those things together. And even if there is the off chance that they're out during the day, you should be able to ID them pretty quick. And one thing we should throw in there about rabbits and squirrels, we don't want to forget about swamp rabbit. We do have them in the southern one third of Illinois, so that is possible. And then uh, the black pelage phase, uh, you may potentially see a black squirrel out there, and that's not a different species, but uh, 
either a gray squirrel or a fox squirrel that's melanistic. So, yeah, no, those are, I don't want to say quite common, but among, you know, a lot of the game species that you see, they are certainly the most common to see in, you know, these, these distinct color phases like that, or that, that mutation. Locally, very common. Yeah. Where I went to college in Northwest Missouri, we had just a ton of black phase fox squirrels. It was almost uh, 50 50. Really? And and regular fox squirrels. So, really, yeah, heightened uh, gene expression in that little town. So, sure. And so, again, just to to kind of reemphasize, those can be legally harvested during the, the squirrel season. If you see a black squirrel, you know, and you're in a legal hunting area, you have all the credentials, it's within season limits. Uh, you can you can harvest that that squirrel. There's there's no protection for these different different color phases. And that's just for squirrel. I don't want to speak because there are some restrictions for deer and some other species. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, now, moving on to, to upland hunting. Um, obviously, there are a few different species in Illinois that you can quote unquote classify as upland hunting, uh, woodcock, sniper, a couple others. But what we're really going to focus on today is is pheasants and quail. Those are obviously the two most abundant, the two most readily hunted, um, and the, the two most commonly hunted species of, of upland birds in Illinois. Um, so the, the ring-necked pheasants here on the left, you can see they have these beautiful colorations. And you may ask yourself, how the heck does that thing stay concealed? I will say when a when a, a rooster is on the ground and not moving, those colors really do blend in quite well. You can usually see that that red on the, the head a little bit, uh, but they 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 do have quite a bit of, of cryptic camouflage, even though they have some of these kind of iridescent colors. Now I do want to to talk a little bit about kind of the the history of ring neck pheasants. I do find it quite important. Um, they are not native to the United States. They are not native to Illinois. Um, they are an Asian species that was once brought in. Um, basically for the, the sole purpose of, of hunting. Um, during that time when they were first, you know, beginning to, to stock pheasants, the quail populations were starting to decline and they wanted a, another opportunity out there for game birds. And so pheasants have, have really kind of taken the hunting community by storm, uh, so to speak. And, and now they are in Illinois, they are by far our most abundant um, upland bird, especially if you compare it to quail. They have a much higher population level than our, our native quail. Um, now, the, the native quail species that we have here on the right is the northern Bob White. Um, you can see we have a, a picture of a female and a male kind of standing side by side. The male is on the right with this very bright white cheek patches and kind of that eye stripe. Where on the female, it's a little buffy colored. It's kind of tannish. It doesn't have that, that nice contrast between the, the black and white like, like the male does. Now, for pheasants, we are only hunting roosters during the statewide season. So that's what we classify as wild, wild birds. These are birds that are just out there living in the landscape. You can only harvest males um, during that, that regular pheasant season. There are some controlled pheasant hunting opportunities or private reserves where they release pheasants that you can go then and hunt. So those are, are not considered wild birds. Those are considered controlled birds. In many of those cases, you can harvest either male or female. Um, but during that, that statewide season hunting wild birds, it's only male roosters. Um, now for quail, obviously it's a little bit harder to, to, to differentiate between gender. And so we don't need to, to, to decide whether it's a male or female. We don't need to know that at the time of harvest, you can harvest both male and female. Um, so you really don't need to, to, to be able to distinguish quail, uh, but it is kind of cool to at least know the, the difference between the two. So here's kind of a, a quick illustration of what a, a female pheasant looks like versus a, a, a male pheasant or a rooster. Um, so obviously the hens are a lot more drab and this is pretty characteristic of, of most bird species across kind of, you know, bird families and, and bird um, different groups. The males are often very coloration, very pretty, where the females are often a little bit more drab. And that, that carries consistently with pheasants. You can see here, the female is very drab colored. She doesn't have these bright iridescent colors, just kind of this drab, you know, cryptic coloration where the, the male is, is much prettier. And so it's, it's quite easy um, when you're out there hunting to, to be able to distinguish between a, a, a rooster and a hen, especially as you kind of flush them, as we'll kind of talk a, about it a little bit. But I, I do want to give a, a quick word of caution. And this is one thing you'll see a lot of times, especially if you're you're watching, you know, upland hunting on TV or YouTube or any of these other videos, when a bird kicks up, you'll hear everybody on the shooting line or everyone in the hunting party go rooster, rooster, or hen, hen. A lot of people are like, oh, that's just to, to make it look cool on TV. And it, it certainly does. It feels cool to be out there, rooster, rooster. But what it does is if you can easily identify it as a rooster, 
second you can tell whether it's a rooster or a hen, everybody should be able to, to start calling. That's a rooster. That's the hen. And so everybody on that line, now, even if you didn't see the bird flush, now Jason next to me, he instantly knows, okay, there's a bird in the air that's a rooster. And he doesn't have to, to think about it. So it's just a, a quick way to let everybody on the shooting line or in the hunting party know there's a rooster or it's a hen, 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 don't shoot. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. When you see that, it's not just for, for looks and show. It does, it does serve a, a little bit of a purpose. Now, the, the northern Bob White, again, I did mention this is our basically most common native galliform aside from, from wild turkey. And when I say the term galliform, I'm essentially meaning nest uh, ground nesting. So these are birds that nest on the ground. They don't build nests up in the trees uh, like, like some of your, your standard songbirds. They are building nests on the ground. And so habitat is a very critical component of that. And if the nesting habitat isn't readily available or good habitat, those populations suffer. And Northern Bob White is one of those. We've seen pretty drastic uh, population declines in the past few decades. Um, it used to be common to kick up a covey of quail, you know, every couple hundred yards and that covey may have 20 or, or 30 unique birds in it. Now you may hunt all day in areas that, that once had Northern Bob Whites and, and never see a covey. Or if you do kick up a covey, it may be a, a dozen or two dozen birds. Um, so Bob White are, are fairly scarce in the landscape and they are really geographically located in, in the southern part of the state in Illinois. They don't really expand too far through central Illinois, even in Champaign here. Um, we really don't have a, a, a Bob Whites around. Occasionally we'll, we'll stumble across some that, that may be left over from a dog trial or a dog competition, but on average they are, they are a tough bird to, to find in Illinois. But when we get into the habitat a little bit, there are some key distinct things that quail literally have to have or they won't use the area. And so those can give you a, a little bit more information um, as to, to, to try to find some hunting spots for, for Bob White quail. But we'll get into that. Um, and Bob White are known for their, their distinct whistle. My mouth's a little dry, so I'll, I'll <whistles> it's basically just this Bob White. Um, and that's the, the male. You'll hear that very common in the spring, especially early in the mornings as that sun starts to rise. That male's going to get on a fence post and just start over and over and over. It's pretty pretty cool sound, but that's where the, the name Northern Bob White comes from is that, that vocalization sounds like Bob, Bob White. Cool, cool bird. Little warning, if you hear that in the city, it's probably a starling. <laughs> yeah, so starlings are mimics and, and you will hear a lot of different birds mimicking Northern Bob White. It's quite fascinating, honestly. All right, so what are the, the, the credentials? Again, we're going to move the, through this pretty quickly. Um, so for credentials, you obviously need a, a hunter safety certification. Um, if you're born on or after January 1st, 1980, if you were born before that, you were technically grandfathered in, so you do not need this certification. I do still recommend taking the course, even if you're grandfathered. You'll learn a lot. Um, and if you are to go out of state, different states have different grandfather dates, and so you may be required to have it for another state where you're not in Illinois. So I do recommend it just taking the course if, if you're going to, to pursue hunting. A lot of good information in there as well. Um, but there are several course types in Illinois. You can take an instructor-led course that's basically a full weekend. You go spend in a classroom with an instructor. Uh, we have an online self-study slash field day course, which is kind of a, a hybrid component, half online, half in classroom. And then if you're over 18 years or older, you can do the entirety of the course online. Uh, there's a, a couple different vendors they use. Uh, one of the big ones is Calchemy. If you go through the Illinois DNR's website and click on Hunter Safety or Hunter Education, it'll have all the information there. Uh, but you can essentially take the, the course at your own leisure um, at, at your computer, and you can do it in probably about eight or eight to 10 hours total. Um, but it does save your progress, so you can do an hour here and there and, and kind of work your way through that through that course. Now, the, the, the online does cost, I believe, at $25, where the the instructor-led courses are free, um, and again, that's just because they DNR has to pay a vendor to build and house this online curriculum and kind of manage that. So that's where that that money goes, where the instructor-led courses are free. Um, I will say it is difficult to find instructor-led courses these days. There's a lot of people who who need the instructor-led courses, especially youth. They can't do it online, so these courses do fill up pretty quickly. Uh, so if you do want to take that option, uh, look into to pretty far in advance and try to get one scheduled out soon. The FOID card. So we live in Illinois, so we are required to have a firearm owner's identification card. Um, regardless of who owns the firearm, any Illinois resident who has a firearm or ammunition in their possession 
must have a valid FOID card. These are issued by the Illinois State Police, not by the DNR. Um, again, we are not DNR employees, we're University of Illinois employees, but we have heard from a lot of DNR staff that they get dozens and dozens of questions about FOID cards every week. They, they, they can't answer them. So if you do have any questions about that, direct them to the, the state police. Um, it does have a 10-year expiration, but they have made some changes to how the process works. So now you can set it up for automatic renewal, attach a credit card to it, and then every 10 years it'll just automatically renew. So it's one less thing to think about. Um, so if, if you are planning on hunting small game or, or really anything with a firearm or even owning a firearm, make sure you get that, that FOID card. And again, that application uh, can be done entirely online. Just Google Illinois FOID card and, and you'll find it pretty quickly. All right, so what do we need in terms of permits and licenses? So essentially for, for small game, it's relatively inexpensive and it's relatively easy. Um, essentially what we're going to need is a base hunting license. Um, there are several different options available depending if you're a veteran, if you're you know over a certain age, if you're under a certain age, but you need that, that kind of base hunting license, which you can see here. Um, usually you can get them for, I think, 12 to 17 dollars again depending on on what license you need for for yourself but there are other options there so base hunting license and then a state habitat stamp now this is not a physical stamp like it would be for the the federal duck stamp this is just an online um, thing that's added to your your hunting license um, it's only five dollars so just make sure to, to add that to your your, your, your license before you go out. Um, now, if you are, I know we're not really talking about dove, but I, I do want to mention that if you are hunting a migratory species like doves or woodcock, you must have HIP registration. And this is the Harvest Information Program. This is again, another free credential that's just added to your license. Um, so you don't need to pay for it, but just make sure you add it. And it will ask you a couple questions. Did you hunt migratory birds last year? How many did you harvest? And it's just a, another way to, to kind of track that. So make sure if you're hunting a migratory species like doves, woodcock, and all waterfowl, that you get that, that uh, HIP registration added to your license. All right, a few site-specific regulations to, to kind of keep in mind. Um, obviously, on public land, regulations can be a little bit more complex than they can on private land. Um, and a lot of that is just due to what the, that landscape at that park looks like. What is the user base? What is the the, what, the population? What is the habitat like? And so these uh, hunter fact sheets basically tell you exactly what you can do, where you can do it, when you can do it, and how you can do it at an individual DNR site. And so these are really good for if you're just wanting to go hunt, let's say, squirrels at Kickapoo. You can easily look at this, and, and it tells you exactly what you can do, what you need to, to be able to do it legally, and that entire process. Um, again, these are available on the, the DNR website, um, so always check these hunter fact sheets before you got to any public land. It's a really good resource that's just very concise and, and simplified. All right, so a few very specific regulations I want to touch base about, just a little bit about bag and possession limit. Um, so bag and possession limit are basically how many of a species you can harvest. The bag limit is going to be how many you can harvest in an individual day. Well, the possession limit is how many you can have in your possession, and that does mean in your freezer. Um, so the, the total limit you can have in your possession is 10 rabbits. So let's say you have 10 rabbits already in your freezer and you want to go hunt more. You need to consume a few of those rabbits to reduce your possession limit to allow you to, to harvest more. Um, now, these can be given away. You cannot sell wild game in the United States or in North America, but you can give it away or donate it to somebody. So let's say you're at your possession limit, but oh, I, the, the, the weather's perfect. I want to go rabbit hunting. You can give away some of that, that meat and reduce your, your personal possession limit so then you can go, you can go hunting again. Now, there is a lottery for rabbits. This is kind of just called the Upland Game Permit Lottery. Unfortunately, it already has expired for, for, this, pat, or for this upcoming season. Um, I will say I never have great success drawing a permit during this. There's not a ton of, of productive sites in the state, and so those that are quite productive get, get a lot of applications for, and they, 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 they typically fill up pretty quick. So I don't have a ton of of, of luck drawing these permits. But if you get one, uh, you're gonna have a, a great hunt, especially if you're, you're looking for upland birds like quail or uh, pheasant. Um, there are some really good productive public sites that you can get through, uh, through this. 
But um, essentially, it's it's an online lab lottery permit. You go through the process, select what sites you want to apply for, what dates you want to apply for, and you'll be awarded a permit if your name is drawn. Now, the, the cool thing is it's entirely free, so I recommend putting in for it every year. It doesn't cost anything. Um, it's at least worth worth trying for. And if you do get a permit, the nice thing is it, it allows you to bring other hunters with you. And so if you kind of develop a, a nice cohort of a, of a couple friends and you all put in, you know, for various places, you may get, you know, two or three hunts out of it that you can kind of share amongst your group and, and kind of hunt that way. Uh, so keep that in mind. Now for rabbit and um, upland hunting, um, not necessarily for squirrel, we're not really talking about squirrel right now, but for rabbit, pheasant, and quail, you do need blaze orange or more recently they have legalized blaze pink. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, you can you can rock your 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 bright pink out there. Uh, but you do need to have 400 inches squared of blaze orange or blaze pink visible at all times. I do want to say a lot of the, the the blaze orange that I see people wearing out on the pheasant field technically is probably not enough blaze orange. You'll see a lot of people with you know a, a big upland hunting vest that just has you know maybe an orange patch here on the shoulders and maybe a small one on the back. You want to make sure you have enough blaze orange that you're, you're meeting that four inches squared requirement. Um, and you also want to make sure you have a, a blaze orange or blaze pink cap or hat, whether it's a stocking cap or a, a baseball hat. This hat, even though it's got blaze orange on the back, this would not legally suffice because there's a lot of, of area here that, that's not blaze orange. And one thing I also do want to bring up is the concept of broken blaze orange. You can see here in the, this camo kind of pattern that's got blaze orange behind it. That is not ex acceptable in Illinois. That is considered broken blaze orange, not unbroken blaze orange. Uh, so that would not suffice. There are a few states, mostly out west, that allow that, that style of blaze orange, um, but not here in Illinois. And unfortunately, you'll see it at every outdoor store you go to, even in Illinois, uh, but they are not legal to be used as, as blaze, blaze orange. Now, if you want to wear it while you're you know, bow hunting for deer or squirrel hunting just to give you a little bit more safety, go right ahead. It's probably great for that, uh, but um, not not so good for, for meeting that, that blaze orange requirement. Hey, Dan, I just wanted to add in there. Um, this is something we might want to find and put into one of these PowerPoints here, but uh, there's a really good, if you just Google image, uh, broken blaze orange photographs, and you can see there's a difference between uh, some some agency did where they had a difference between a solid blaze orange and then the broken blaze orange and the guys were standing in a hedgerow and then the one guy took they took steps back and you would quickly not be able to see the broken one even though he's wearing orange you'd think that it's still orange is orange but there is actually a pretty big difference between the two it makes a big difference yeah yeah all right so moving on a little bit to squirrel so squirrel the bag limit is five so again that's how many you can harvest per day so one hunter can harvest five squirrels per day, and in their possession, they can have 10. Um, now, I do want to remind about shooting hours. So for squirrel, it's half hour before sunrise to half hour after sunset. Now, I do want to caution a lot of people. This season is very long. It's August, basically through February is the, the squirrel season. It's quite a bit difficult to hunt early in the year. Obviously, it's warm. Uh, lots of leaves are still in the trees, so it can be quite difficult just to see the squirrels kind of, you know, scampering up the trees. Um, but also there's a lot of public sites that basically close squirrel season for deer season. So once archery season kicks in, a lot of these public sites close down for squirrel hunting. So again, just make sure you're checking those hunter fact sheets to make sure that just because the, the statewide season is open does not mean that it's open at that individual public land site. So always refer back to those, those hunter fact sheets. A little bit about legal methods of take. So this is what, what firearm or what equipment we can utilize to, to harvest small game in Illinois. Um, basically, you can use rifles, shotguns, or archer equipment, depending on the species that you're targeting. Um, now for, for squirrel, most people will prefer a 22 uh, rimfire rifle or a small gauge shotgun. Um, now, there are a, a few kind of key differences to keep in mind. Shotguns, especially if you're using a big like 12 gauge with a three inch shell, and you're using big shot size, there's probably not gonna be a lot of meat left on that carcass. So it's kind of finding that, that nice balance between enough stopping power so you get that humane ethical harvest, but an, enough, not, not too much, you don't overpower it so you don't destroy you know, the, the usable meat from that carcass. So that's why a lot of people prefer the, the 22 long rifle because it's a, it's a great single projectile. 
it's quite accurate out to, you know, 50, 60 yards, depending on your rifle. You can shoot further than that um, in some instances, but it, it allows for a nice quick headshot where you don't, you know, ruin any of the, the carcass or any of that usable meat. Now, one of the, the big issues is a lot of the DNR sites, again, these site specific regulations will restrict it to shotguns only for squirrel hunting. So you can't even use a, a 22 long rifle. There are a few sites across the state that, that do allow it. And if you're on private land, then you're, you're, you're really good to go. Uh, but for most people on public land, for, for rabbit, upland, squirrel, you're going to be thinking about a shotgun. So a shotgun is a great option if you want to get basically one firearm that allows you to do it all in Illinois. You can go from hunting doves to hunting squirrel, to hunting geese, to hunting deer, to hunting turkey all with with one firearm so definitely something to think about but just remember to check those hunter fact sheets to make sure if you are using you know a 22 that that site does allow you to use 22. so i kind of talked about most of this already but i, I do want to mention a little bit that no uh, rifles during firearm deer season obviously there's going to be other people out there with shotguns muzzle loaders and then uh, that kind of thing. So no rifles during the firearm deer season. It basically closes down uh, for, for lack of a better term. But again, perfect for, for private land and perfect for those areas that allow it. If I had the opportunity, I would choose a 22 99% of the time. Um, early in the season, I might choose a, a shotgun just because, again, it's a little harder to see through those trees. And you may catch them, you know, jumping from tree to tree and being with a shotgun, they're kind of designed to be able to, to shoot at moving aerial targets. So it's perfect for that. Um, so I would prefer a 22 if I could use that across the board, but shotguns are, are quite effective. Now, one of the, the big challenges about shotguns, again, is, is choosing enough stopping power, but not having you know, too much to where you destroy all the, the usable meat. Um, you can use any shotgun gauge to, to hunt small game in Illinois. When I hunt a uh, squirrel or something with a, a shotgun, I really prefer a 410, a 28 gauge or a 20 gauge. Um, any higher than that, it can certainly be done with a 16 or a 12. <coughs> but again, you just want to make sure you're using a light load so you don't totally destroy that carcass if you're using some of the, these bigger gauges. Um, now, I do want to highlight a very, very important regulation and probably one of the more, um, I would say, forgotten about from a, a lot of people, especially if you're, you're new to the hunting community. Um, your shotgun can only be capable of holding three shells. Even if your shotgun can hold eight, but you only have three shells in it, you are technically in violation. And so they sell what's essentially called a plug. And it's basically just a, a plastic piece. This is just a marker, but basically the, the exact same thing. It's just a, a piece of plastic that goes in the magazine tube of your shotgun that restricts the space. So you can't put any more shells in that shotgun. Um, refer to your shotgun owner's manual. Um, they'll, they'll tell you how to install one in your specific shotgun. Most times when you buy a, a new shotgun from the store, it's either going to have a plug installed already or there, or there will be one in the box. Uh, but if not, they're literally a piece of plastic. You can buy them for, for five or 10 bucks um, at, at most sporting goods stores. So just make sure that if you're using a, a semi-automatic or a pump shotgun that can hold more than three shells, that you restrict it so that it cannot. Now, I do also, since we're still talking about shotguns a little bit, I do want to talk about non-toxic shot. This is something that's starting to increase more and more across the, the landscape, not just in Illinois, across the board, across the country. Obviously, lead has some very serious issues with contamination and with health effects. And so we're starting to see a lot more individual sites starting to restrict the use of non-toxic and restrict the use of lead ammunition. So again, this will all be in that, that Hunter fact sheet. Um, if it's required at that individual site, I imagine we're going to see more and more sites continue this direction as, as, as things progress. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Now, I, I, we, we always get a, a bunch of questions about what's kind of the, the best shot size. You know, if I'm, if I'm looking for, for squirrel, what is the, the best shot size, you know, out there? I have a, a little bit of a, a probably a differing opinion. I'll let Curtis kind of jump in here too, and, and Jason, if they have any thoughts. Uh, for me, I only shoot non-toxic at this point. Um, since everything is starting to shift that way, I'm just kind of naturally starting to, to shift my efforts to all using non-toxic shot. So the most common is going to be steel shot, but steel is a very different metal than lead, and it performs completely different. If you're used to shooting lead number nine out of your shotgun, and then you go shoot 
steel shot number nine, it's going to perform vastly different. It's a heavier, a denser, lead is a denser metal. It's also a softer metal. And so it performs quite a bit different. So the, the kind of tech simplified comparison that a lot of people make is you want to drop down two sizes in steel to match that, that same efficacy of a lead load. So you can kind of see here a, a quick note for this conversion, steel shot three is ballistically similar to steel shot number five for steel shot number six is ballistically similar to lead shot number seven and a half or number eight. Now for squirrel, I prefer using steel shot number six. I find that to be quite effective. And again, I'm using a 410 or a 20 gauge here. Um, so it's it's not, you know, a 12 gauge with number six, that would probably be overkill in, in many instances. Uh, but I have found with a 410 and a, a 20 gauge, number six steel shots perform quite, quite well. Um, now, obviously with steel shot, you want to make sure you, with lead too, you want to make sure you get all of those pellets out of the carcass before you begin consuming it. But if you've never shot steel before, steel is much harder than lead and you can break a tooth pretty easily. Um, so your first few times, if, if you don't feel like you got all those BBs and individual pellets out of the carcass, chew soft at first. <laughs> don't want to break a tooth on steel. Obviously, lead is a little bit of a softer metal. Um, again, you're running into other issues with now you have lead that you're ingesting. But um, just kind of keep that in mind if you're using non-toxic make sure you to make that conversion so that you can kind of keep that straight but with that i'm going to turn it over to curtis and he's going to talk to us about rabbit hunting um actually it's gonna be jason curtis oh jason yeah well. sorry yep you're right yep yep no worries um all right so yeah so rabbit equipment so similar to what i said earlier about the equipment you need to get into this it's pretty minimal so you're going to be needing uh, some good pair of boots. Um, that's the thing you always want to put money into first before anything else when when going outdoors really is just good footwear because if you can't be outside for long, um, it takes all the fun out of it. So get some comfy boots. You can walk some miles in. And then uh, you get some brush pants. Um, I was admiring Dan's brush pants the other day. He, he had it in the office there. Um, so there are these specific pants that are made. They can be like a jean material, but they have these extra thick um, canvases on the outside of the, of the legs. So that way when you're walking through brush, um, you'll get all scratched up and then uh, you're going to want a shotgun normally but again sometimes you can get out there with a 22 and then uh, a game vest and uh, something to consider depending on how warm it is outside uh, with rabbits and other animals that you're especially mammals when you're putting them in your game vest they can have fleas on them or ticks and things like that so uh, use caution when you're doing that but if it's a uh, it's really cold out it might not be too bad but that's something to keep an eye on uh, you might need a black bag too that might help help you out so then uh, for rabbit hunting, uh, you can see the majority of the cottontail range is uh, the eastern central United States, and they're going to be looking for some thickets, um, some cover that they can hide in, and we call it a kick and brush pile. So there might be, if you want to do some habitat maintenance on your land, if instead of getting rid of all the cut honeysuckle and stuff, you can just put a pile of that somewhere on the edge of a field and rabbits will move in there real quick. I mean, you can go back there a couple of weeks later and just start kicking those piles and you'll be kicking rabbits out of there. So thick rows around around edges of fields and things and uh, any thicket or or really thick uh, cover you can kind of walk walk through or uh, if you have dogs with you, even better and you can have them go smell around those areas to try to kick some rabbits out of there. I want to jump in real quick Jason just to, if you can go back to that one slide. One thing I, I want to highlight and I just kind of thought of this at this moment um, but rabbits are again following kind of the, the same population trends that I, I discussed a little bit with pheasant and quail and you can kind of see here you know jason talked a little bit about what their habitat needs are and how they really need this kind of thick brushy habitat he was talking about you know brush piles that's certainly a, a way to, to to manage for them but historically illinois was was kind of broken up with these very small section farm you know we had a bunch of family farms that were 20 acres that were 40 acres that were 60 that were 80 which were all separated by kind of these overgrown hedgerows or overgrown fence rows kind of like you can see here in the, this picture unfortunately as we've kind of had the, this shift to you know large-scale agriculture which obviously in, in some essence we needed to, to support you know a, a growing population of what seven billion people these days um, so a lot of these these prime habitat areas were just basically cut down and converted into the normal ag field. And so historically, we had all this patchwork of of you know annual grains, whether it was wheat, corn, some beans, mixed you know wrapped around with this edge of of native vegetation that had plenty of berries, plenty of cover, 
all kinds of stuff that that you know pheasants quail and and, and rabbits all all need and we've just really seen that that kind of drastic reduction across the landscape and unfortunately the the population trends are, are following right along with that no absolutely So for tactics, um, basically you're gonna be walking and kicking the brush up, like I said. So um, you're gonna have a group that's gonna be walking 10 to 20 yards apart and making sure that you're in a safe range. We're gonna have a diagram of that when we go over upland hunting, but basically you kind of get in a row and you walk and uh, you make sure you have like your little pie slice that you're, you all agree, like I'm shooting from this way to this way and make sure that uh, you're not crossing uh, your shot pattern with each other and uh, make sure if you're hunting with a dog that you're, you're the dog's far enough away for taking a shot, especially rabbit hunting because you're shooting at something else that's on the ground that's uh, usually pretty far ahead of the dog. So you're not too close to having to shoot the dog because the rabbit is pretty fast. Um, the dogs are just there really to get them up and moving. And uh, you'll see a rabbit quite a far ways in front of a dog whenever you're out. But in case that dog is fast uh, or right up on the rabbit and just broke it out, um, make sure you're being safe with that as well. Um, so yeah, so you're just kind of walking around and, and cooking up this brush. Uh, you can check south facing slopes when it's cold out. A lot of times you're gonna be rabbit hunting when it is cold out or after a frost. So uh, they're gonna wanna stay warm. So south facing slopes, sunny areas. Um, if there's snow on the ground, uh, you wanna look for tracks and scat. And uh, that's a nice benefit of going out in the winter time too. So uh, this is really fun, especially if you get your deer early season um, or during the rut and then going out and trying to do something fun during December, uh, it's a good time. Yeah, one other so piece of sign oh. I'll throw in there, a lot of times, especially when we get snow on the ground, you'll see all the saplings and uh, young trees that are gnawed on right at the tree level. That's usually rabbits. Nice. Uh, so then uh, you also can see, and also they're easy to track, right? <laughs> so if you're looking for rabbit tracks, you, you don't have to worry about them getting kind of confused with other things. You can see the big feet. Uh, but the traditional rabbit dogs would be beagles. Um, so if you ever have a friend with beagles that can actually take you out, it's gonna be a sight to see because it's pretty neat how they work. Um, they run in circles. So rabbits as a, uh, to try to evade predators run in circles. So that way uh, they kind of go back on their scent a little bit and it helps uh, confuse the animal that's chasing them. But uh, beagles are really good at following them and, and chasing them around in circles and circles. But the good thing about being a hunter while that's happening is that you can get second and third opportunities at the same rabbit because it's just if you just sit there and wait they'll come back and you'll, your dog will, will circle and back towards you uh so that's really really cool to see when it works out um so again yeah li same... literally when you hunt with beagles i mean I, I went on a hunt with a few a couple of years back and literally i the way i i rabbit hunted i always rabbit hunted you know growing up without a dog so I, this was brand new to me but he basically said when we kicked the, the rabbit out of this brush pile stand right here and wait and literally that's it and those dogs like jason said will just run, run run that rabbit in circles and circles yeah i gotta throw in i grew up doing this like my grandpa was a big uh, rabbit hunter with beagles so i would uh, like 50 rabbits a year pretty much every year growing up and it's a lot of fun and uh, like if you watch the rabbits they make big circles and little circles so the, the big circle is going to be directly tied to their home range. And so you'll actually, you can tell if it's a female or male rabbit by the size circle it's making. Your experienced uh, rabbit hunter with hounds can tell that. If the dog's barking too far away, that's a buck rabbit. And, and he'll know that. And uh, But they'll also make little circles. Like as they're going, they'll ring around trees. And that's what uh, sets apart really good dogs from bad dogs because just imagine if you're following a linear scent and now it's circling around a tree, you know, you do that a couple times and you're lost. Which way did he come from? Which way did he go? So a really good dog will be able to uh, like decipher that and go on the hot trail, not the cold trail, which will be backwards. And one little note, if you're ever hunting with people with beagles, always ask if they want you to shoot on the jump because a lot of them will say, absolutely not. You never shoot a rabbit on the jump. They want it to do at least one full circle. And at that point it becomes legal game. Uh, so always default to whose dog it is on those ethics like that. That's a good point. And just to, to kind of summarize, rabbits are absolutely delicious. If you've never, never had wild rabbit, 
um, definitely give it a, give it a try if you have the opportunity. It it is one of my favorite wild game meets. I don't I don't do a, a ton of preparation for it. I'm I'm kind of lazy and and I just fall back to the basics of of basically deep frying it like chicken wings, and it is quite quite good. It's it's white meat like chicken. There was definitely a long time in human history where rabbit was the popular white yeah. meat over chicken. It's only with the advent of the double-breasted ch- chicken that uh, rabbit <laughs> kind of weaned its way out of our diet. But yeah, good. I, I like squirrel better, but it's it's good for a white meat. <laughs> hey, Curtis, going back to um, how hunters might not shoot a rabbit on the jump, is that for the safety of the dog or is that for the sporting and giving the rabbit a chance to get away? What's the What's the real reason for that? Well, both. Yeah, one is safety because generally on the rabbit jump, you're surprised and you may have multiple little dogs that are not much different than the size of the beagle running around. Uh, So it doesn't give you that chance to plan. But two is also that's why they're there, really. They're they're there to watch the dogs run. So (laughs) if they could... If they could walk out there and uh, just kick up rabbits and shoot a limit, like that wouldn't be fun to them. They would rather let their dogs out there and just shoot one and watch them run all around, you know, because that's the joy in it for, you know, a lot of the people that are that are still big beaglers and hunting with with the dog. So uh, twofold. So, yeah, really good question but always default to the landowner and always default to the person whose dogs it is. Yeah. And it helps train the dogs. You know, they might say that's fine, but it's up to them. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, it makes sense that they want to train their dogs to, to, to do that circling and get get a good dog that knows how to go with the hot scent and stuff. And if you're shooting them right away, then they don't ever get the training chance really. So yeah, then they're just running in the woods. So yeah, they, they want and it beagles have just beautiful voices i mean i like the sound of coon hunt hounds and so many dogs and uh but beagles when you are on a cold night in a little hollow and you got three or four beagles uh howling like that's that's music i mean that's music <laughs> to my ears anyway and maybe because it brings me back but uh yeah they they really got a good sound to them this made me imagine you, if you ever seen the Big Lebowski when he's sitting there listening to bowling pins drop oh, yeah. to like bowling yeah. games, just imagine <laughs> Curtis sitting at home and by his fireplace listening to sporting dog barks. Yeah, right, right on my rug that really ties the room together. That's right. Um, another thing, I, uh, Dan's going to mention this with the upland, but uh, it goes with any flushing uh, animal that you're trying to flush up. Uh, make sure you work on your pacing. Don't go too fast and also stop once in a while. Um, when you stop, because the, these animals freeze and they're really good at camouflage and they will stay still as one of their first instincts of trying to avoid a predator, they'll stay still. But if you stop, they think they get freaked out. It's almost like staring at someone. <laughs> and then yeah, uh, they, they, they essentially think the predator off. pinpointed where they are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it yeah, freaks them out and then they'll take off, even if you can't see them, but uh, they, they think you see them. So then they'll run. That just brought back a vivid memory. I was hunting with two of my good friends in high school um, Adam and Jesse, and we were stopped and like talking. We were in the middle of a rabbit hunt and we hadn't seen anything in a while. And we stood in this area for a good five minutes, all about this discussion about how we work this country over and we need to go somewhere else, all this stuff. And we hadn't, didn't take a step. And then a rabbit jumped up right between all three of us. It was there the whole time. Every time. We had been standing there and, and it took like five minutes of us talking, moving around, and then this rabbit jumped up, and and the hunt was on again. But uh, yeah, that that you talking about that made me remember that. Yeah, and again, you don't happens. have to have dogs to do this. I I've, I've been fairly successful through the years hunting. Just you know, me myself, just walking through the woods, kicking up brush, kicking, walking through the thickest habitat that's there. You don't have to have dogs, so don't don't let that be a hindrance to your your participation. Yeah, completely different style of hunting for sure. Both can be enjoyable for different yeah. reasons, I'd say. All right, Curtis, you can take us over to squirrel. Squirrel, one of the greatest things about squirrel, other than being like incredibly delicious, is that like you basically need almost nothing to go out and hunt them. Okay, so we've got some things here that can make your time in the woods a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, some kind of little chair like these that you see here. Uh, can definitely make it more comfortable to sit out there. 
But if you're kind of a minimalist hunter, like I try to be, a lot of times I'm just going out there and walking, spot and stalking and, and standing and not really uh, spending much time sitting down. So uh, those kinds of things don't really um, uh, appeal to me too much. But if you'd rather go out there and sit and wait, that's another great tactic you can use. Definitely a chair is going to be more comfy than sitting on a log. Uh, now, camo is good. You don't absolutely have to have orange for squirrel hunting, but what I will say is if you may shoot a rabbit, you better have orange because orange is required for rabbit hunting. So if you're just small game hunting and you may shoot a squirrel, you may shoot a rabbit, uh, you better be wearing the orange because it is required for them. Uh, but especially early season, most people are going to be camoed up, um, you know, wearing orange squirrels. Most people think see uh, very similar to deer. So wearing orange is definitely not like a detriment to hunting them. So um, for safety purposes, if you want to wear it, especially if you're hunting with a, a buddy and you want to know where everybody is. Nothing wrong with breaking out a little bit of orange for the squirrels. Um, and just like with the rabbits, a game vest can be a good way to carry them. But if I'm going in the early season, uh, just for the reasons Jason mentioned with the, the possible lice, ticks, and all those different uh, creepy crawlies that I don't want on me, I like to hang them in the open air. So I will just pick up a, a dead stick that's basically forked on one end, and I'll sharpen it a little bit. And then I'll poke that between the tendon and the back leg of each squirrel and, and carry them that way. And that way they're in the open air. So uh, they're not, you don't want them to be sitting in a closed space, but I don't necessarily want them right on my back either. So that's the way I do it. Uh, game vest is super convenient, especially when it's cold. Okay, squirrel behavior. Got the fox squirrel up there staring us down. Um, early season, most of the time they're in the trees. This can be a fun time to hunt them. It's hard for the reasons that Dan mentioned. All the leaves are on the trees, yes. Uh, but if you do have a private spot where you can hunt with a 22, I find it to be a lot of fun. Because I basically know if you get into the late August time frame, that's when squirrels start hitting hickory nuts pretty hard. And if you can find a grove of hickory trees, just stop and listen. You're going to hear all kinds of noises, birds, everything moving up and down the trees. But the one thing that's going to stand out is this chewing, chewing on something hard. And that's squirrels. Okay, because birds don't have teeth, so they're not chewing. So if you can find that chewing and and uh, basically like try to cue in on that and then try to get yourself in a shooting position, um, it really feels like a miniature spot and stalk. And it's hard because, yeah, there's leaves. You may not get a shot. There's a hundred different ways it can go wrong. But uh, dang, is it fun? So and that's what it's all about. Uh, definitely shotguns, another good tactic early season, because like Dan said, uh, they're hard to see. So jumping tree to tree might be the only shot you get. Um, if, if the goal is to bring squirrels home, uh, definitely packing the shotgun. Now, once we get into the mid to late season, uh, really, they're going to be into this caching behavior. So there's going to be days where they're on the ground more than they're in the trees. We actually experienced this. We went out on a windy day and think about life as a squirrel. How easy is it to jump limb from limb on a gusty, windy day in Illinois? Uh, I can't say that I've tried it, but my guess is it's pretty dang hard. So they're, they're going to be on the ground. That's a time where they're looking for food on the ground. They're caching food. They're visiting their caches. Um, we walked around and had a squirrel hunt last year where I think probably 80% of the squirrels we got were on the ground, not in a tree. So definitely can happen. You also get the leaves off. So now you can start to see further away. So now, uh, whether you have a shotgun or a rifle, you can kind of get some mini spot and stalks. Cause if you see a squirrel a hundred yards away running around, You've got to get into either shotgun or 22 range, which is, you know, pretty similar to one another, really, if you think about it. 
And uh, uh, that can be hard to do because squirrels out in the country are not like these city squirrels that you got to chase off your uh, trash can every day to take out your garbage. They're being hunted by everything out there from people uh, to birds of prey to bobcats. And um, they're, it's tough being so delicious, I can only imagine. So they're, they're pretty wary. Uh, makes for a good time out there. Uh, and squirrels do have two distinct breeding seasons. So one in the, the spring and early summer, and then one in the winter, which you can start to see them uh, be active towards the end, end of the season there in January and February. And this can be a time where I haven't done a lot of squirrel calling, but the people who do use calling, I've heard it can be uh, pretty good this time of year. I, I don't know. I've always wanted to try it. I just, uh, I, I never have. So um, but squirrels are definitely moving. It's almost like they're rut. So it's another time when the, there's not a whole lot going on. Leaves are off the trees. A uh, fun time to go out there and, and uh, get some, uh, what's, I saw a shirt that called them uh, chicken of the trees. That's not a really fair example because I think they're better than chicken. They're, they're not white meat like rabbit. They're like something between white meat and dark meat which is hard to explain, but um, that's what they are. Almost like a, a chicken thigh is what I like to, I guess, compare them to, which again is not a great comparison, but it's probably the most common thing that would be similar. And habitat, we're talking about trees when we're talking about squirrels. So you gotta find the trees and really you need mature trees. Uh, so, um, yeah, they need forests with mature trees that are nut bearing. They, they have the mass to support them. Uh, they also have shelter because squirrels want to live in hollowed out places in trees. That's their number one spot. So they will build these drays, which are squirrel nests that you see in the picture down there in the lower, uh, right. And th those will be just kind of a irregular nest like that built out of twigs. And um, they will uh, build those and use those, but they actually do prefer a hollowed out um, uh, tree because uh, it provides a little bit more protection. Especially now we've got uh, predators in Illinois like bobcats who can climb. So uh, they, they're not, they, we all heard the story of the little piggies, right? And what happened when you make a house out of, out of sticks. So I can imagine if a bobcat could get into a dray uh, that squirrel may, might have been eaten, but he looks pretty safe up there in that hole. I don't think a bobcat's going to be, unless he can reach in there and, and grab him, but uh, that looks a little safer to me. So you're looking for the same foods, really, that you're looking for when you're looking for deer, and a lot of it is tied to these mass crops, you know, acorns, beech nuts, hickory nuts, walnuts, um, and at different times of year, uh, in the early summer, they'll be eating like maple buds and, uh, you know, buds and, and seeds and stuff like that. So really what you want is a diverse stand of mature timber. And of course, just like deer, they really do prefer the white oak style of acorns. They're a little bit more palatable than the red oak style of acorns, but beech nuts, hickory nuts are great too. And, um, you know, they'll even collect walnuts, too, as an alternative food source. So all good things to look for. <clears throat> now, when you're scouting, um, what you're really looking for is habitat. Because luckily, we have enough squirrels across the, the landscape, just like we do rabbits and deer, that if you find the appropriate habitat, squirrels are going to be there. Um, you just know this. So if you have those oak, beech, hickory, nice stand of mature trees, there are squirrels. You can almost 100% guarantee that, but there's other things you can look for. Uh, they like to feed on a nice flat area that's a little bit heightened because it gives them a, a place to look for predators. So you see that squirrel there sitting on that stump. If you see uh, remnants and nuts and, and acorn hulls and shells and all that stuff sitting on a flat place. Uh, you can bet that a squirrel's probably using that and that might be a good spot to uh, to sit and ambush them. 
Uh, you can see tracks. There's the track. So a little bit different than our rabbit tracks, which uh, I think most people know the typical rabbit tracks in the snow are kind of the two dots in a line and then the two big dots for the big feet. And uh, so squirrels a little bit different. They're more in like a parallelogram shape, I would say. They got kind of longer toes on both the front and the hind feet. And uh, you, you usually will see the claws there. Um, but yeah, their tracks are pretty pretty obvious if it snows, but a lot of times if we don't have snow on the ground, you're not going to see stuff like that. So if you just find the right habitat, then you're going to be in squirrel territory. You can always look for the drays and stuff too uh, for further sign that they're there. And listen, um, if you've heard the squirrel, you know, when squirrels get agitated and they kind of bark at something, you can hear that a long ways off. So that can be another way you, you may start a a spot and stalk using your ear, um, just like you do in the early season when you hear them chewing. So another great thing about uh, squirrel hunting is you can, so many different ways, literally any way you can think of, you can go out there and sit, you can sit on the ground, you can sit on a tree, you can walk around, you can spot and stalk. Um, if you just have squirrels are the one type of hunting I feel like if I get off work and I have like two free hours I can go hey I'll go squirrel hunting because all I got to do is grab like two or three things and I'm out the door almost nothing else no other type of hunting you can think about is that quick and easy to go for at least not for me so uh, squirrel stands out uh, for that, but, and just, yeah, any which way you like to hunt. If you, if you are a stationary hunter, there's so many squirrels out there, sit and wait. If you see squirrels moving a little ways off, move there and sit and wait and uh, just keep doing that. <clears throat> Let's see, you, um, yeah, always use your ears, obviously. And if squirrels are on the ground, one thing I will point out is it actually can be advantageous if you do have a deer stand. If the squirrels are spending most of their time on the ground, you're going to see way more activity if you elevate yourself a little bit. So not saying I'm going to like pack in a stand just to squirrel hunt. But if I am squirrel hunting like my family's property in Missouri and there's a stand there, and the squirrels are spending time on the ground because it's uh, rainy or windy or, or the trees are hard to catch for some reason, then I'm getting in that stand because I'm going to see way more squirrels than, uh, than I will on the ground. So yeah, this is definitely my favorite way. Uh, mobile, I like to stay standing and just slowly walk. Or if you're in um, a part of the habitat that you think is not ideal, you can quickly walk and get back into ideal habitat and start just slowly walking through the woods and walking like an animal, which means stopping. Like people are about the only thing in the woods that moves in a very direct way. And, and it, you'll know this if you're in your deer stand and you hear somebody walking by, you always know that it's a person because it's the only thing that's choo, 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 just constant. Every other creature in the whole world is going to be ch -ch -ch. Ch -ch. like, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop. And if you incorporate that into your own movements, uh, you'll be surprised how many, what kinds of animals you can really walk up on. I've been walking around like that squirrel hunting and seeing some of the biggest bucks of my whole life and uh, not even wearing camo. So anyway, keep in mind how you're moving. And another great thing, you can do it in small groups. It can be social. You can go out with a, a friend or two and that can really be uh, productive because sometimes when you do see a squirrel that is agitated at you, they'll run to the other side of the tree. And so you'll be in this game like uh, the Three Stooges or Elmer Fudd, where you're chasing this one squirrel around the tree, and it's constantly evading you because it's easier for it to walk around the tree than it is for you. So um, having more than one person there kind of eliminates their ability to do that. 
just always make sure you're maintaining, uh, you know, safe and proper shooting angles. And remember that 22s are notorious for ricocheting. So I definitely don't do the run around the tree um, routine with multiple people. If you're, if you're using a 22, that's more of a, a solo thing. And never shoot into a nest or a dray. That's uh, not allowed, not legal, not ethical. Even if you were to hit it, okay, what then? It's stuck in the dray. You know, what have you done? <laughs> you know, so uh, be ethical out there. Even though they're smaller critters than deer, it's the same thing. You've got to answer for every shot you take. Uh, so make sure you're you're taking good ones. Now with a dog, I've rabbit hunted with a dog a lot of times, super fun. I've actually never squirrel hunted with a dog. I think it would be fun. I, I know about it. It's really popular down south. Dan, have you done this? I have. I went out with a, a few individuals in Kentucky. They, they run Land Between the Lakes, which is a big kind of national recreation area there. And I'll tell you, if I had the, the money and the time to spend on squirrel dogs, I might choose squirrel dogs over upland dogs. There was just something really fun about it oh. what were what was their preferred dogs they mountain curs or yeah actually mountain curs and then they did have a couple coon hounds which was a, a little bizarre but they they seem to do quite well and the interesting thing i found about squirrels opposed to let's say upland or even raccoon to to some extent with dogs they were very good at keeping that rabbit in a, in in the tree that they were treeing it up um, obviously raccoons kind of the, the same to some extent, but let's say they, they, you know, track the squirrel running up a tree. Normally, you know, the, the guy I went out with, we had about four or five dogs just working with, with two hunters. And so all four or five of those dogs are around this one tree and basically just bark up at that tree in hopes that then that squirrel, like Curtis was talking about earlier, gets agitated. If you've ever heard them, they just, and they'll just get up in the tree and just bark. And bark and so that squirrel's just up there looking down at the dogs barking and you just walk up you can make a perfect ethical harvest make sure you hit exactly where you want uh, so it, it's really quite special and quite fun to do uh, but again most people don't really you know do too much squirrel hunting with dogs just because again like like curtis mentioned a lot of people it's all oh, it's squirrels it's it's tree rats but if, if squirrel hunting is your jam and you want to look into getting some dogs it's definitely worth worth looking into it's a lot of fun and very very productive yeah, just think about the access, you know, there's so much more access to something like squirrels than yeah. something like deer and turkey. Yeah, that's just the, that's the truth of it. You know, if you hunt squirrels, and especially I find if you hunt in a different way, like my brother-in-law is a falconer, and that gets him so much hunting permission, kind of like trapping does for me, because it's different. Like when you do something different, People find that out and they're like, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. Well, yeah, sure. You can go hunting. Like, can I come and see? And then right, can I come watch? Moments. Yeah. But then he has full hunting permission, uh, falconry and otherwise for the whole year. And like, that's just a great way to get in. So I could see squirrel dogs as being one of those unique things that might get you in some other doors because people would be like, oh, squirrel dogs. I kind of want to see that, you know, sure, yeah. Yeah, you can go hunting. And then next thing you know, you're a part of their deer camp. <laughs> and and like I said, it, it was so productive, you know, between the two of us, we, we both had our personal limits within, you know, under an hour. A lot of fun. But with that, we'll kind of move into to pheasant and quail. Um, now, I, I want to talk, I, I mentioned a little bit about kind of the, the population status of these birds, uh, especially pheasant and quail. It's it's trending down. It's substantially down from where it was, you know, back in the 1970s or even a few decades ago. Um, and a lot of that is due to habitat degradation, habitat destruction, habitat removal. Um, we basically changed what the landscape in Illinois looks like and wildlife populations are basically seeing the, the, the impacts of that. Um, so pheasants have quite specific needs, but in general, they're going to want native warm season grass fields. And so these are our native prairie grass fields. We've all seen those grass fields that are, you know, six, six feet tall or so. That's what we're looking for, for, for both pheasants and quail. And the, the, the big distinction, we can, we can talk for hours on, on what native warm season grasses are and, and why they're important. But one of the, the big things is it creates vertical structure. Pheasants and quail, one of their, their biggest 
predators that they need to avoid are avian predators like hawks, like owls. And so this, this vertical structure of the vegetation that comes up and kind of creates this nice little canopy creates that, that vertical cover that they need from those avian predators. And the way these grasses kind of grow is they're a clump forming grass, as opposed to the grass you have in your front yard, which is, you know, typically fescue, bluegrass, these types of things. These are what we consider cool season grasses. And they form basically a dense mat kind of vegetation, like where prairie grasses will form a clump and then another clump here and another clump. And so it basically looks like this maze under top this kind of canopy top from the, the the vertical structure of those grasses and so that allows the birds to again they're ground nesting basically ground living to just run around through this little maze find seeds find insects all while having having that that nice kind of vertical cover overhead um, <clears throat> typically you're going to find these in areas that are that are mixed with agriculture um, there's a, a a program by the federal government called the conservation reserve program that essentially the federal government pays farmers to not farm these areas and to convert them back to wildlife habitat. A lot of those practices are converting these, you know, tilled acres back into prairie grasses, back into native warm season grasses. So oftentimes you'll find these kind of two habitat types kind of intersecting well, and that, that can hold a, a lot of birds. Now, pheasants do need some brushy habitat, not near like quail do, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, but having some some brushy vegetation or some woody vegetation throughout that that prairie grasses is is pretty important for for pheasants, but extremely important for for bobwhite quail. So the way I kind of like to describe it is good quail habitat is usually good pheasant habitat, but just because it's good pheasant habitat does not meet does not make it good quail habitat. Quail are a little bit more specific, and again, what they really really need is that woody cover. Um, I talked a, a little bit earlier about, you know, how we used to have these, you know, family farms that were all segmented and kind of split with fence rows. And these fence rows often became overgrown and had this, you know, very brushy edge habitat. Um, that's what quail needed to thrive in, especially during the, the winter. During the summer and spring, they don't necessarily use the woody vegetation a lot. They still do. But what they really need it for is, is winter cover. It provides a little bit of thermal cover to, to keep them out of the wind, but it also provides them an avenue to, to stay out of, you know, water, whether it's snow, ice, or rain. And so that woody cover is pretty, pretty consistently uh, missing in a, in a lot of their, their native ranges, and that's why the populations are continuing to decline. And so if you're focused on, on finding northern Bob White, again, make sure you're in the southern part of the state where you're actually in you know, that, that Bob White range, but look for prairie grasses that have a lot of woody vegetation, whether it's woody vegetation on the edges, or in some cases you'll find it in the middle. Maybe there's a big blackberry patch or a, a, a big, you know, sumac patch, um, or maybe there's some oaks that are starting to, to kind of reclaim. Those are areas where you're going to, to find quail. If, if you're in a big prairie that has no woody vegetation, chances are you're not going to find quail. You may find pheasants, but not quail. So just kind of keep that in mind of how important that, that kind of woody vegetation is. Now, I do want to bring up um, one, one kind of program. We did talk a little bit about, dur you know, during the, the legal game section, we talked about the, the difference between a wild pheasant hunt and a, a put and take or a controlled pheasant hunt. Um, so the, the big distinctions are, again, the controlled pheasant hunt allows you to, to be able to harvest a male or a female, so a hen or a rooster. If you're hunting wild birds, it's roosters only. Now, the, the Illinois DNR does have a controlled pheasant hunting program. You can also find plenty of private hunting clubs or sportsmen's clubs that do their own controlled pheasant hunt. But if you're looking for the Illinois DNR program, it's about $30 uh, per, per resident that allows you, again, to shoot two birds. So you can shoot a rooster or a hen or two roosters or two hens, whichever, whichever you flush and you decide to shoot. Um, and the, the, the nice thing is there, you're going to find birds, you're going to see birds. And I, I, a lot of people, when they envision this kind of put and take or a controlled pheasant that, you know, DNR is out there with baskets and, oh, let's put a, a pheasant there. Let's put a pheasant over there. In reality, that that's not at all how it happens. How it happens is they'll drive out there with, you know, a, a truck with some pheasants in, in either a cage or, or in their truck bed, and they'll basically just open it and let those birds go. And so it still does have that, that kind of appeal of, of you're out there hunting. But again, it's a, it's a good way. It's a good introduction to upland hunting if you just want to either A, try it or B, just get started. 
um, it's a it's a great opportunity. And and access and opportunity are abundant. Um, you can reserve your spots online, uh, which is the the way I recommend everybody doing it. If you're going to go through the the controlled pheasant hunting program, you can pick a date and say, hey, I want to go ahead and already reserve two spots for this day for me and my buddy. And you pay your sixty dollars, thirty bucks a piece, and then you get to go up, show up, and hunt. And the, the, the reason I prefer to, to do the online reservation versus just showing up in person and paying, which you can, assuming they haven't reached their you know final limit of how many hunters they allow, but they decide how many pheasants they're releasing based on how many online reservations they have. So the more online reservations that are in the system, they're going to put out more birds that day, just because that's how many people they know are coming. So just keep that in mind. I, I recommend the program. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to get started. And even if you don't have a dog, you know, most people hunt upland birds without dogs. Uh, we'll talk about strategies that you don't have to use a dog. But if you want to hunt with a dog, you can go to some of these controlled pheasant programs. And the majority of time, you're going to have to get there about an hour before you can actually start hunting. You normally have to sign in at eight. The hunt starts at nine. And so you're kind of just hanging out with the other hunters. Oftentimes, I, I've walked up to a group who has a, a couple, of, hey, do you guys care if I come hunt with you guys? Nine times out of 10, they don't care because that means they get another shooter on their line. That means they are, their dogs get to get a little bit more work in. And, and so even if you don't have a dog, you may want to, to look into this and kind of think about this as an option. Now, when, when we're actually talking about the, the practice of hunting and the strategies, we talk a lot, about, a lot about wind direction for deer but not a lot of people give thought to wind direction for upland hunting. And I would say it's arguably just as important for upland hunting as it is for, for waterfowl and for deer. Um, obviously for deer, you're worried about that blowing your scent to the deer, but with, with waterfowl and upland, it's going to dictate where the birds fly, how the birds attempt to land, how the birds take off. And so we'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, typically, I like to work into the wind um, and we'll kind of get into a, a couple reasons why. Um, but when a bird flushes, they typically want to flush into the wind to help them escape. That's kind of how it, it allows them to catch wind and to be able to, to control their flight. And so when they first take off from the ground, they want to fly directly into that wind, let the wind catch under their wings, and then they make a, may make a turn to fly with the wind so they can get extra speed to get out of there. And if you're working into the wind, that means now the bird's going to flush away from me, catch the wind, hopefully again not all the time but hopefully catch the wind and try to ride it back to me so that's almost giving me kind of two options to try to to make a shot at that bird now it doesn't always happen that that picture perfect but that's kind of what we're we're striving for and what we're hoping for but i always want to have that wind in my face as much as possible even if they don't come and and catch the wind and then try to fly with the wind to, to escape them having to to fly into the wind to for that initial takeoff is a great opportunity to take to take your shot. Pheasants are big, slow birds. Um, I will say if you've never hunted pheasants before, when you first flush a pheasant, you are going to think that you have to rush it. You're going to think, oh, I've got to get my gun up really quick and get, get. you have so much more time than I think anyone gives them, them credit for. And oftentimes, especially if, if it's a, a pheasant, you want to let them get a little bit a ways away. If that bird flushes, you know, five to seven yards away, and here I am with a 12 gauge, three inch shell shooting shot five, and I, I send that through a bird that's, you know, seven or eight yards away, there's not gonna be any meat left. And so it's kind of, again, this balance of letting that bird get far enough that, because the way shotguns work, right? Shotguns spread out as that, that, that shot progresses. The closer it is to the barrel, the tighter that pattern is. So at five or seven yards, it, it's a hard shot. I mean, you're basically shooting a single projectile at that pheasant, where if you let that pheasant get, you know, 15, 20 yards, your shot cloud may be this big. And so it's gonna A, preserve the meat, but B, increase the likelihood that you're actually going to hit the target. And so there is kind of this balance of letting it get far enough away. And I, I say that all to, to say, when you flush a bird, you don't have to rush. You have a little bit of time to watch that bird, to let it get a little bit away, because they are big and they are slow and they don't do a lot of aerial flights. They kind of have this nice consistent upward arch as they're, they're flushing away. And so it's a great opportunity to let them get a little bit of distance and then take your shot. But again, we always want that wind coming into our face as much as possible. And so you can see here in this illustration, we're kind of talking about, you know, if we were hunting with a dog and there are kind of two types of, of upland bird dogs. 
Um, there's obviously a plethora of different breeds and everybody has their own favorite breed and all that, but there are kind of two basic groups. There's a flushing breed and there's a pointing breed. Most people are probably familiar with the pointers. We've all seen them, you know, back in old TV shows and, and stuff like that, where the, the dog finds a bird and he gets on a nice pretty point and just stands there and holds that bird where it's at. And a really good bird dog will know when that bird is trying to walk away and he will actually move his point to keep that bird in that spot to then allow the hunters to come up and either signal the bird to then flush it or for the hunters to come up and flush it. On the opposite side, we have a flushing breed. And so this is a breed, this dog is not going to, to try to hold that bird. His only job is to try to find that bird and get that bird in the air as quick as possible. And so that it's kind of different styles of hunting. With flushing dogs, you need to be right up with that dog and you need to be able to anticipate a bird flushing at any point. Where with a pointer, you have a little bit of indication where that bird, that dog's going to be sitting on point. Okay, there's a bird there. Now I can get prepared, get ready. With a flushing breed, you don't always have that 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 kind of warning. Now I will say with with flushing dogs, I I have a flushing dog. They're golden retrievers. Most people don't think of them as as upland dogs, but uh, mine are, are pretty decent. But when they start to to pick up bird scent, they get what, what what we call birdie. And so you'll start to see them get a little bit more excited, a little bit more agitated. Their nose will go basically stuck to the ground. Their tail will start doing you know a, a very fast style twitch. And the more you hunt with that individual dog the more you start to learn when that dog is, is getting birdie or is on bird scent. And that can give you an indication that a, a flush is coming. Because again, that, that dog is just going to run straight at the bird and try to get it in the air rather than allow you to, to come sneak up on it. Now, typically when we're, we're upland hunting, you can kind of see here, these orange circles are kind of indicative of our hunters. They're kind of representing those hunters. A good bird dog is going to almost work in a circle around the hunters. And all the whole time, all it's doing is trying to find scent. When it gets real challenging is when you have an experienced dog who likes to work, you know, 50 or 60 yards ahead of you. Well, if that's a flushing dog and it happens to flush a, a bird 50 or 60 yards away, you're never going to get a shot. It's already too far. And so it's, it's kind of this fine balance of having a good dog that stays close, but also covers horizontal distance and moves back and forth. Not everybody has them circle behind. I've trained mine to, to circle behind me and to come up again and make it a little wider and kind of circle that way. I find that to, to, to work pretty well. Some people will train their dogs just to do, you know, this nice crisscross across the field. But when you're hunting with dogs, not only is the wind important for the way the bird flies, but also it's pushing that, that scent to the dog as opposed to if the, the wind was reversed. Now all that scent is going away from the dog. And so the dog isn't able to pick up on that scent very quickly. And so it may miss birds. It may just flush birds that it didn't even know was there yet. Um, so lots of different things. So that wind direction is critically important, not only for, you know, the, the way the bird flies, but also the way the dog works. And it also helps us to have a little bit stealthier approach. Even if you're not hunting with dogs, if you have four guys walking through a field, it's quite loud. And if the wind is blowing all that sound directly to the birds, they're probably going to hear it and they may just kind of walk off and sneak away and never flush for you. So having that wind blowing at you kind of keeps that sound blowing away from the birds. And so it's, it's, it's another benefit of having that wind kind of directly in your face. So here's kind of obviously an incorrect wind direction. Now, obviously you can't always plan a field to, to hunt it the way the, the wind hunts. But in a case like this, if that wind direction switches on me, if I have the option, I'm just going to go switch to the other side of the field and hunt that direction. Um, I will always choose to have the wind in my favor, even if it means I'm going to maybe miss out on some areas that have really good looking habitat. And I may have to come back to them from a different direction. I will do that because I want to make sure I have that wind proper for me, for the dog and for the birds. So when they when they flush. There are a few really important weather considerations. Um, now, not only do these impact what the birds are going to be doing, but it may also impact how the birds react to, to, to being hunted or to being flushed. On warmer days, you're typically going to see birds are flushing fairly easy. They may even be flushing what, what a lot of people, a lot of bird hunters call wild flushes which means those birds are just flushing 80 to 100 yards away and you're not really sure why. The dog's not getting to them yet. They're not hearing you. They're just way ahead of you flushing. That happens quite regularly on warm days. 
on colder days, it's going to cause them to sit a little bit longer, especially if it's wet, whether it's snow or, or rain, it'll cause those birds to hunker down and sit to where you may have to walk from, you know, me to the wall behind me to, to get them to flush up just because they're so, they feel so camouflaged that they, again, know, hey, I don't need to move here. It's cold. I need to stay here and I'm going to stay here until that very last second where I feel like, okay, I'm either going to flush or I'm going to get eaten by some kind of critter. And that's when they'll take off. So just kind of keep that in mind, focus on areas with, with shade on those, those warmer days and focus on areas with heavy cover on colder days. And if you're in an area that has some terrain and topography, Jason talked a, a little bit about a little bit ago during the rabbit section about hunting the, the, the south side of slopes. So the south side of slopes get more solar radiation throughout the day and throughout the year. So they're typically warmer, but they also have different vegetation. They all, they're usually going to be higher density of vegetation. There's going to be more stem count, how many individual stems of plants are coming out. And again, that's just because of that warmer climate that gets a lot more sun, so they can photosynthesize a little bit more and get more energy and grow faster. And so not only are you, you know, getting warmth through the sun, but also more cover over there just because the, the vegetation is going to be a little bit different. So if it's a very cold day and you're in an area that may have some terrain, if you can focus on the, the south side of a slope, that may be a pretty good spot to, to kick up some birds. Now, a few strategies for getting birds in the air. It can be difficult, especially if, if you're focused on the, the controlled pheasant program. These birds may not flush readily. Um, they, they like to sit tight a little bit longer. And some in some cases, wild birds just know how good their camouflage is, how good a cover they're in and they may just sit there and wait. So I'm gonna go over a few different strategies to keep in mind where you're, while you're upland hunting that causes these birds to actually flush rather than just run away. Cause we don't wanna shoot birds while they're, they're running away. Um, especially if you're out there with a dog and you're in six foot tall prairie grasses, you literally have no idea what's in front of or beyond your target. And so we always wanna let these birds flush and get, get elevated. But in some cases, they may not flush and they may just run. And so we're going to talk about a few different strategies to ensure that they're actually flushing rather than, than just running. The first one is pretty self-explanatory. Don't stop short. Pheasants, particularly quail, to, to some extent will do this, but I've seen it a lot more commonly with pheasants. They will basically just walk right ahead of you. Bill, okay, I'm safe. Nothing, nothing, especially if you're walking at a consistent pace, like we talked about a, a little bit ago and Curtis brought up during squirrel hunting that, well, now you sound like, you know, a human. You don't sound like a, a predator. Uh, oftentimes that, that, that pacing can adjust things, but we want to make sure we don't stop too short because if we're just pushing those birds and they're just walking or running in front of us, eventually you're going to get to a point where they have to make a decision. Okay, this, this habitat's gone. I'm coming up to the edge of a road or I'm coming up to timber or to a mowed field or something that can oftentimes force that last little bit. Oh crap. I'm at the edge of the habitat that can force a, a flush there at the end. So don't always, you know, make sure you always go to the, the very edge of, of whatever habitat you're pushing just in case all you're doing is just walking those birds ahead of you. Um, so that's a, a pretty good tip. Um, another tip that some people use, I don't know if it's one of our strategies or not. It is not. But in a case like this, you can also set up what we call blockers. And so <laughs> let's say you're working this strip here that we have this illustration where the pheasant is. You could have another hunter or two standing at the edge of that field, basically forcing those birds. Now they're being kind of sandwiched. You have the hunters over here with the dog pushing to these other hunters that are kind of acting as a block. And so when those walking birds get towards the block, well, now they experience danger again, and it's going to cause them to, to flush. Now, in a case like that, you want to make sure you're very safe. You understand where all of the hunting parties are that you're with. And they, again, you let that bird get elevated enough that you see what I like to see is blue sky beneath the belly. If I see blue sky beneath the belly, that means I'm he's elevated enough that I can take a safe shot because there's nothing in front of or behind. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking for. But that is another strategy is to have blockers set up and work the field to those blockers, which will then cause any of these runners to flush there at the, the edge of the field. Another really common strategy, I use this pretty much every time I'm up on hunting is pausing, just walking, you know, 15, 20 yards, stopping for a little bit, walking 50 to 70 yards, stopping for a minute or two, just changing up the pace of that, that walking, 
changing up the cadence of your walking. So you kind of have these irregular intervals that can cause birds to flush. Because if a bird is, is sit tight in his, his cover and he knows, you know, you may be 10 yards to the left or right of him and he's just sitting there. If you just walk right by him, he may just sit there. But if you stop and pause, now that bird's going, uh-oh, something spotted me, something smelled me, something's. So now he's immediately on edge. And like Curtis said with rabbits, oftentimes that can cause that flush, just this intermittent kind of irregular pausing that just sounds more like a natural predator, not necessarily like a human. Another really important one, especially if you're hunting without dogs, I highly recommend this. And again, I've hunted a lot of, of, of pheasants and quail without dogs. Um, this applies to, to both pheasant and quail, really all of these strategies do. But walk in a zigzag pattern. If you're just walking with one or two people down you know, a field, you may not be covering all of that habitat. And so I like to work in kind of the zigzag pattern so I can cover as much ground as I can in that field and cause basically as much disturbance to really force those, those birds into the air. So don't always walk just a, a straight shot through the field. And I know when I first started up a hunting and I, I see it with, with new people I take out all the time, when you first start pheasant hunting, you're going to go to these fields and you're going to see mowed strips through the field. Everybody wants to walk through those mowed strips. And sure, it's, it's a lot easier walking. You're not going to, you're not doing any good walking through these, these mowed strips. You want to get in the cover where the birds are. It's going to be a slower pace, which is probably good in all reality because it's slowing you down. Um, but you're also walking through the cover where the birds are going to be. So those mode paths are, are nice to walk through, but you're not going to kick the birds out. So the zigzaggy pattern really works well. And I, I will do it so much so that I'll zigzag and, okay, there's a little patch of, of vegetation that looks different than everything else. If everything else is this nice tall grass prairie and then you have a, a little section of, of some blackberries or something that just looks different, I'm zigzagging over to that section and going to another section that looks a little bit different and another and trying to pinpoint these higher quality areas that look a little bit different than the monoculture of the rest of the prairie oftentimes those can be be holding birds and, and can be quite effective to just zigzag back and forth to these different kind of high quality areas now obviously as you're walking from these areas to the next you're probably still going to be kicking up birds here and there because they're going to be using those prairie grasses as well but I really like to focus on trying to find those those differing habitats while I while I'm out there and pinpoint and kind of zigzag uh, between those back and forth. Oh, basically, like I just said, work the cover and hunt small patches. So many people, especially for for pheasant or quail, think you need you know 800 acres of just nothing but but solid prairie grass. And while that certainly can be fun to hunt, and there's probably going to be a lot of birds there. There was a lot of little grasslands like this that that kind of just are on the edges of, of ag fields, kind of like we talked about a little bit ago with the Conservation Reserve Program, where they're paying farmers to put back these habitat practices. A lot of these little acres can hold birds and can hold lots of birds. Um, so don't think just because something is just a very small parcel of, of ground or a small piece of habitat that there's not birds there, because there, there certainly could be. And this is an, another big one. Um, I'm going to kind of tie this right in with kind of the irregular spacing and pausing strategy is to just slow down your pace. We all, when we're out there, we want to cover as much ground as possible. And oftentimes that causes people to just get in this mindset of I'm walking straight to that edge of the field and I'm just going there and I'm just walking at my normal walking pace. When I'm upland hunting, I'm not walking at my normal walking pace. It's a lot slower and it's a lot more deliberate. Um, so just keep that in mind. Don't just walk at your standard walking pace like if you're taking the dog for a walk or going to walk around the block. Use these irregular patterns, slow down a little bit, and take your time and focus on these areas of, of high quality habitat throughout the field. So if I'm walking through a field and I see a patch of sumac, walk into that patch of sumac over here. Okay, now I found a very tall section of big blue stem. Everything else was kind of shorter prairie grasses. Now I found this nice section of tall. I'm going to zig to that one and I'm going to kind of zig the whole way I'm going there, walking nice and slow and just kind of continue back and forth, kind of snaking across that field, trying to cover as much ground as I can, always with that, that wind in my face. And oftentimes in Illinois, the wind can change directions. Um, if that does happen and I'm working a field, I usually continue working that field in, in kind of the same way. Um, now, when I finish that field and maybe I'm looking to, to move to another field, then I'll, I'll think back to the, the wind direction a little bit. Um, so 
slow down your pace, push the habitat to the end, no habitat left uncovered. So focus on all of those little, even if it's a little piece. Um, I know we were out, oh, where was I last year? Uh, Moraine View State Park. It's a, a controlled pheasant uh, program site here in, in East Central Illinois. And we were hunting this field, <coughs> the wife and I and, and our two dogs. And, <coughs> excuse me, it was about a 40 acre field, um, just solid prairie grasses. We worked the whole thing. You know, hit it, hit it pretty good. Um, kicked up a few birds. I think we only had one bird down at the time. And when we were walking back to the car, there was a little mode strip with another tiny section of of you know prairie grasses that was maybe an acre or two. They're like, oh, we probably sh should just kind of walk through that. We ended up getting our last three birds in this little itty bitty section. And reflecting back on it, I think a lot of it is again we probably pushed those birds when we first got there. They didn't need to flush. They just walked into that little cover. We never bothered them again, so they just kind of hunkered in there. We're like, oh, I mean, we're safe now. And then when we, you know, coming back, we finally saw, oh, there's that little piece of habitat we missed. So always cover as much of the habitat that's out there as, as you can. And last but not least, watch for runners. This happens a lot, um, especially the, the controlled pheasant birds. Um, they don't really have, the, basically a lot of their evolutionary traits have kind of been selectively bred out of out of you know the, the controlled pheasants not not you know by nefarious purposes it just kind of that's the way it happens if you keep interbreeding these these captive birds over time they're going to start to lose a little bit of that wild genetics that that you know predisposition to flush and fly away from predators and so oftentimes you'll have a lot of birds that just run um, and that that's when it's really important again to, to to slow down if you start seeing a lot of birds are just running and not flushing that means A, check your wind, make sure that wind direction is correct for you, and B, slow down your pacing, be a little bit more deliberate, try some of these zigzagging and, and uh, kind of, you know, pausing, try some of these different strategies to slow them down and to convince them, I need to flush. This is not a predator I can run away from. I need to fly away from it. Um, and so just kind of keep that in mind. But upland hunting is by far one of my favorite styles of hunting. I know I say that pretty much every type of hunting, but upland is completely different. Up, really small game in general. If you're a deer hunter or a turkey hunter, you know, you're used to sitting alone. You're just sitting there by yourself, just kind of, yeah, waiting for things to happen. Small game hunting, a lot of times you can talk, you, especially up with hunting. We can be having a conversation. You know, if we're on the line, Jason, Curtis, and I, we're hooting and hollering, you know, chatting back and forth as we're hunting. And it's a, it's a lot more social. It's a lot more fun. And it's, it's, it's something to always enjoy, especially when you get to, to watch the dogs work. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, so we have some upcoming webinars and a workshop this weekend. If anyone's interested in coming to Champaign, Illinois, we're gonna be doing remote scouting and uh, wild game tasting here uh, on campus. So if you wanna come and see where our, it's a home field advantage for us this weekend. So we get to do it in our offices here. So um, if you're available, come on over, it's gonna be 11 a.m. And it's gonna to go to three, it might be over in the two o'clock hour, we'll see. But um, it should be a fun one. We're going to do some hands-on mapping. You'll, you'll be able to point out. This is going to be geared towards deer hunting, but uh, we'll also talk about uh, other ways to scout the land and, and other species that you might want to look for and habitat types that they may reside in and how to mobilize yourself to go and, and find them. And then we're also going to be talking uh, on some webinars here. So we have duck hunting strategies and techniques. That's me next Tuesday um, from 7 to 8.30, and then also rut hunting strategies, and that's going to be October 27th, and that's good timing because rut should be happening in the following days after that, so if not already started up by then, so at least pre-rut. So it's a good time to be in the woods right now. After this heat wave's done, I think we're going to be having a couple hot days here. Once that breaks, it's going to be a good time to get out. You were moving yesterday, yeah. and um, they're going to be moving again after this heat gets passed, um, so we got more coming up um, at the start of every month. We sit there and lay out kind of what our schedule looks like for that month. So uh, every month just come back and check and see what we have posted and look at our newsletter and that will give you all the updates you need to, to stay uh, current with our offerings here as a program. Yeah. And we've got a, a really cool event coming up that we're still kind of wrapping up the, the final details for um, it'll be up in kind of the, the Chicagoland area, but it's going to be focused on, deer scouting and really trail camera usage. And so we're gonna go up a, a few weeks ahead of time before the event starts, scout the area, hang up some trail cameras. 
Um, and then during the event, we're going to review those trail cameras, talk about why we selected these spots, what we're looking for now, how we would go about hunting these spots, and what the trail cameras can kind of tell us. And so it's going to be a really fun kind of interactive event. So I'll be looking out for that. We'll probably have the details released for that in the next week or so. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's going to be, I think, December 4th. It's going to be the first Saturday in December is when that's going to be. And, yeah. Um, and then we'll go up and get those photos and it's going to be at a preserve where we're not allowed to hunt, but at least that means that the deer won't be pressured. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we'll yeah. get some, maybe we'll get some good, good photos at that point. Um, so it's going to be a preserve on the South side of Chicago there. And uh, we're super excited because it's a beautiful area. Um, beautiful. Yeah, it's going to be a fun to work out of. Yep. So we have time for questions. If anyone's around, if not, you can enjoy the rest of your day. Um, so if anyone has any questions, let us know and we'll be here to answer them. Yeah, it's 1241, so we'll hang out for, you know, four minutes or so, and then we'll kind of take yeah. off at 1245, but thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Nope. How quickly do you need to clean and process game after harvest, Dan? That's a fantastic question. Uh, so a, a lot of it depends on the, just for, for lack of a better term, the weather. Um, I, I, I will give a, a better answer, but I, I do just want to kind of make this quick segue. Um, so most bacteria starts to form at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's, that's when leaving meat basically on a counter is, is you know, not safe. It, it's not following standard food safety practices. So for, for wild game, I, I kind of personally follow the same trend. And like Curtis was saying, that, that's one of the big challenges about squirrel hunting right at that, that first start of the season in August. And I'm even the same way with, with deer hunting. I've been hunting once so far uh, this season, and that, that's not because of, of lack of interest or, or anything like that. It's just been a little too warm for me. And the reason I hunt is for the, the meat. Um, so I actually will pick my hunting days on days that I have a little bit more time to, to focus on the actual food rather than trying to rush everything. Um, but for pheasants and quail um, i typically like to get them field dressed within two hours or so if it's you know 40 degrees or so um, the, the warmer it is if it's you know 55 60 i will oftentimes take a cooler out with me with some ice so i can at least start to get that the, that that carcass cooled down as, as quick as possible um so really what you're, you're kind of focusing on is that at 40 degrees or so now what i would caution I, and i i been guilty of it i have friends that that do it in high school going out you know august 1st when when squirrel opens up and shooting a limit and it taking you four hours to to shoot said limit and now you've got you know four carcasses that are probably not safe to consume at this point um so again i'm looking at the the weather that 40 degrees if it's around 50 i'll give myself an hour or so um but any anything below that and i i want to get that done pretty quick uh, couple other questions. Recommended choke for pheasant. That's a great question. Um, a lot of it depends on the individual load you're going to be using. Um, me personally, I like to use a fairly open uh, choke when I'm when I'm pheasant hunting. Again, pheasants are, are fairly big birds um, and they oftentimes will flush fairly close to you. Again, you'll have some flushes that are, you know, 20 yards out or so. I have found a lot of my experience, especially with my dogs, the flushes are happening within probably five or, or 10 yards of me. I know Jason and I were hunting, I think it was the last year or the year before, we were hunting with my dog and his dog and, and they both flushed one up that was, you know, literally two to three feet between Jason and I, and all of a sudden they ended up flushing it. And so a lot of it depends on, on your style of hunting, but I like to use as, as open as I can. Um, I, I don't know that I'd go past improved. Improved is probably the, the tightest pattern I would get. Um, I prefer a little bit more open than, than improved. But again, I'm also shooting shot five steel. Um, so that does perform a little bit differently through choke tubes. Uh, you kind of need to view lead versus steel in the same way you would for shot size as you would for uh, choke tubes. So for instance, if you're using a, a, a choke tube that's designed for lead ammunition and it's a full choke and you now send the steel through that full choke, that's going to condense it even more. And in that case, you're probably going to shoot the end of your choke tube off um, or it's going to damage that choke tube really bad. Because remember, lead is a very soft and malleable metal. 
And so that allows it to kind of deform against that, that choke tube a little bit where the steel is so hard and so dense that it just slams into that choke tube and can really cause damage or, again, can just cause that choke tube to go flying out of the end of your barrel. Extremely dangerous, ruin your barrel. So I use very open with steel. Now, if I was, was shooting lead, I might go to improved and, and probably be okay with, with lead. But for me, I use steel shot, so I like to use a fairly open choke tube. Modified is, is kind of my, my, my go-to. Good question, though. Um, when it comes to like the, you need to, do you need to keep sex on your, on your roosters? Um, if you're field dressing. Yes, field you do. Yes. Home? And yep. then, um, yep. for species where you don't really, the sex doesn't matter. Can you field dress a squirrel in the field? I'm, 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 you can, and, and you can still, yeah. uh, field dress a, a, a quail or a pheasant. Um, obviously again, quail, we really don't need to know gender, but you do want to always leave some way to identify that, that bird. Usually most people recommend, um, what it's required for waterfowl is leaving a fully feathered head or a fully feathered wing attached to that, that carcass. Now, when I'm small game hunting and I know I need to get that meat, meat cooled down, all I'm doing is removing the internal organs and in, in the gut and, and paunch there. I'm not going through and plucking the entire bird or skinning the entire squirrel or skinning the entire rabbit. I'm just opening up that carcass, getting that, that big source of heat that, that's kind of trapped in the stomach where all the, these organs are, remove that source of heat that allows then the, the carcass to be open, which allows that, that cooling to, to start cooling that, that meat down pretty quick. And so that, that, that's a, a really good question. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. Sounds good. Thanks, guys.